Hello uh, and welcome to i3 TV. I'm Damien Wells of Spark Communications and joining me today are Ed Ansett, the founder and chairman of i3 Solution Group. And we're very pleased to welcome Peter Gross, the founder of PMG Associates. As a grandee of the industry, Peter probably doesn't need much introduction, but since we are working in a mission critical industry, I'm not going to make any assumptions. In short, Peter has over 30 years experience in the engineering and design of power systems as they are applied to data centers. He's worked for a range of companies from Teledyne Technologies, where he served as chief engineer, to EYP Mission Critical Facilities, HPE, and Bloom Energy. And today he sits on the board on several boards of directors uh, and advisors for public, private and not for profit companies. Peter was the founder of the Critical Power Coalition, a non profit consortium of electrical power companies committed to addressing operational, technological and political issues as they relate to on site quality, reliability and continuity of electrical power. And in 2010, he was the recipient of the prestigious Data Center Dynamics Outstanding Contribution to the Industry Award, um, an award that he shares with Ed, who I, Peter won it in 2010, Ed in 2012. I'm the only person that doesn't have that award today. Um, in the session, Peter and Ed are going to have a Q&A come discussion about the technologies available to data centers, which might help them to operate with greater autonomy from utility power grids. And in doing that, they're going to touch upon some of the pros and cons of independent power generation to those running data centers, to those running power grids and to other consumers of power. So that's a good place to start. Ed, what's um, what's triggering this increased interest in distributed power generation? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a number of things. I mean, one is the constraints that utilities are under in terms of the um, the increased electricity demand, which is fairly consistent globally. Um, and the other kind of pressure point is um, the, the need to be seen to be and act to be more sustainable. Um, so it's, 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 it's those two factors, I think, are the, are the primary issues that, uh, that are behind this. If I may add, uh, uh, there is probably one more factor that has to do with uh, the, um, the quality uh, and reliability of the grid. Uh, the grid is aging uh, and there are concerns about its reliability due to, as I said, but also climate factors, uh, you know, primarily in the US, you see uh, fires and hurricanes and uh, and all kind of other uh, events that uh, that are degrading the uh, the ability of the grid to supply its, its customers. And uh, also there are concerns about um, about um, cybersecurity, physical attacks, things of that nature uh, that uh, are driving a lot of companies to to thrive to have more control over their power destiny. So that's that's in addition to the two factors. So uh, let me let me just ask you something because I, one of the things I hope to do today is to clear up for some of the listeners some terminology. Okay, um, I'd, I'd like to sort of start by asking for a definition of microgrid in general sense, as opposed to just a data center sense. Right, right. Um, yeah, there are, you see around a, a variety of definitions, but uh, I think that uh, um, there are three factors that define the microgrid. Uh, one is you have to have a group of interconnected loads. That's factor number one. You have to have a group of distributed energy resources. Uh, and the third factor, you have to have a clearly defined electrical boundaries. So these three elements define a, uh, a, a microgrid. Uh, together, they, fall, they form a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. So microgrids, so in essence, you have to have a number of distributed energy resources, whether they are uh, uh, solar panels or uh, or fuel cells or uh, diesel generators or batteries with inverters and then you're going to have to have a multitude of of loads 
and uh, and finally you have to have the this clear defined boundary. What controls is the, the the controller, the the device that intelligently uh, controls both the the DER, the distributed energy resources, and the load is the key to the to the success and uh, the operational uh, the operation of the of the of the microgrid. Mm. What uh, in the context of data centers, you know, uh, this it's not that that easy to to define a conventional data center as a microgrid simply because you have you typically have the first the first element you have you have utility you have um, uh, diesel generators typically you have batteries ups's uh, so you have multiple of, of sources uh, but you have a single a single load essentially inability to to control uh, control the the, the load uh, uh, is a, a, a factor that might preclude the uh, the conventional definition of a microgrid for UPSs. Let me, ask you, some, yeah, let me ask you something here. So um, and then one of the things again for people listening is that we should be clear that what we're talking about here it's varies across geographies. OK, so I think that we'll, we'll try to confine this conversation to constrained utilities. I mean, right. just how dependent are the utilities on the implementation of, uh, you know, private distributed energy resources? I mean, what's the uh, what's the situation there? Well, um, it's interesting. Um, um, you everybody knows about the the uh, uh, the d difficulties certain utilities have in uh, certain regions around the globe, whether it's Ireland or Frankfurt or uh, or Northern Virginia, uh, Ashburn in, in particular, uh, Northern California. There are all kind of places. Um, off off grid uh, um, um, data centers have not been very common in in the past, but now um, I see a, a, uh, a clear research in uh, projects that uh, that are either wholly off the grid or uh, uh, have a connection to the grid, maybe not for the entire uh, capacity of the uh, of the data center, but maybe uh, partial. Uh, but uh, I, I think that. Uh, um, the advent of a number of uh, uh, distributed energy resources that it can provide a reliable uh, continuous source of uh, energy are making this type of, of projects more more um, accessible, more affordable, and and clearly we, we see projects of this nature being developed um, in many places around the world. There are. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of a number of projects in Ireland. Uh, uh, there are a number of projects in uh, Northern Virginia. There are projects in uh, Northern California, and all use typically. Um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, the type of uh, uh, energy resources uh, uh, used for on-site generation, but there are a variety of options there. How do you see op the opportunities for data center operators that you know typically don't? participate in grid interaction, at least historically haven't, and we're seeing a kind of a gradual move um, towards uh, grid interaction from data center operators. How do you see that progressing? What's the benefits? What are the pros? What are the cons if you're a data center owner? Clearly some some um, economic benefits in terms of uh, demand response, in terms of um, um, frequency regulations, uh, this this could have significant benefits uh, in in terms of uh, um, um, economics. Um, now um, we're going to probably start seeing more and more interaction, both both in terms of power, but also in terms of other components. Uh, the integration of the data center within the community, uh, the fact that. Uh, um, um, Probably in the near future, uh, um, heat reuse uh, we're going to become mandatory. Uh, and that has to do with uh, with the whole uh, energy efficiency program uh, uh, and uh, lower carbon objectives. All these things uh, are are creating an environment that uh, that are you know uh, 
affecting the uh, uh, the design param parameters of the data center quite significantly. Um, the uh, the ability of um, of um, the the power source within the UPS to interact with uh, with the utility is is becoming a, a major a major component of this uh, new architecture for data centers. Uh, components such as BES, uh, battery uh, battery energy uh, uh, storage systems are becoming uh, very 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 interesting, uh, and this is a device that. Uh, um, essentially uh, centralizes uh, the, the major comp power comp within a data center. So it's a, uh, um, a power electronic system uh, that uh, um, has a front end, bi-directional front end that will enable uh, the, the power to flow from the batteries uh, uh, to, the, to the load, but also from the battery to the grid. Uh, or from the grid into the batteries and into the load. Um, that uh, has a, this front end is sometimes could be four quadrant as opposed to just, just simply bi-directional. Uh, and uh, this device replaces the diesel generator, replaces the conventional UPS with its own batteries, um, replaces uh, uh, the incoming uh, uh, transformer. So uh, uh, it's one block that will dramatically simplify the architecture of the data center, will make, uh, will make uh, the system more, more reliable, easier to uh, operate, and more economical and more efficient. And, yeah, and the sustainability benefits, right? I mean, when you look at the, the that's right. depending on the grid intensity, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to calculate. Um, you know, there's a, there's a plus from uh, using battery energy storage, but even when in, in countries which have got low, relatively low grid intensities, there's all those transmission losses that can be um, reduced or avoided um, by that. So, so, so the benefits therefore are twofold, aren't they? One is revenue benefits, but possibly more importantly, are the sustainability benefits. And then you mentioned heat reuse and the whole question of circularity. So, I think this is a very important point, actually, in, in, in the future of data centers, right? This, this business of being <clears throat> meaningfully sustainable. Heat reuse, we're seeing that now um, being mandated in some countries in Europe. Right. And I don't know about you, but I actually believe that we're going to see data centers in some parts of the world being told to participate in demand response as opposed to it being voluntary simply because of the utility constraints and the available energy storage within data centers. What do you think about that? I see the same thing. Uh, um, um, it's still a uh, rather uh, nebulous uh, domain. Uh, there is no clear regulation, but uh, but um, you know, in this in this whole permitting. Um, uh, you know, cities are uh, are scrutinizing uh, uh, data center project now closely uh, for a variety of reasons, and it's probably another topic to discuss uh, why data centers are are not all that popular these days. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I'm aware that the situation where the cities will uh, are going to require um, the uh, the data center participation in their uh, in their uh, um uh grid reliability process because simply because uh, um um a lot of the a lot of the grids in Europe as well as in uh, uh, other parts of the world and certainly in the United States there are certain grids that are uh, uh, approaching uh, uh, the maximum capacity especially this time of the year and uh, and uh, the utilities are struggling are really struggling to find ways to uh, uh to deliver uh, reliable continuous power in environments where um, you know everybody is turning on their air conditioning and uh, uh, everybody uh, <laughs> everybody's charging their automobiles at the same time and so on so let's let's just change uh, topic a little bit now okay and we'll talk about on-site generation and the types of on-site generation that you think are going to emerge as winners in the in the short term and perhaps in the longer term. So what I mean by that is which technologies, which energy storage technologies do you think we're going to be using first? I think you know we've mentioned we've mentioned batteries and types of batteries we haven't really talked about. And then other energy storage techniques, perhaps those that 
you know, many people haven't heard of that you know of that you think are going to get traction. Could we talk about that for a minute? Certainly. When it, when it comes to distributed generation, um, we have several groups. One is the more traditional, conventional uh, reciprocating gaining engines or uh, turbines. They've been around for a, for uh, for a long time, and, uh, and they are reliable, well established. Uh, but uh, they are uh, they use combustion. They uh, generate a large amount of uh, uh, carbon. Efficiency is not is not terrific. Uh, so there is a, ten, a, a trend th these days not to use these kind of devices for distributed generation for specifically for UPSs. You still see them in other applications, uh, in, uh, campuses, uh, college campuses, uh, some some uh, um, um, university campuses and so on. For data center in particular, probably the, uh, the most widely used um, and uh, probably the best uh, uh, perspective for for being a, a major uh, provider of distributed generation are uh, uh, fuel cells, particularly solid oxide fuel cells, which are base load devices, and uh, they have um, you know remarkable efficiency for uh, for any kind of device. Uh, um, the efficiency starts at around 65 percent and average uh, over 53, 54 percent efficiencies throughout the life of the of, of the equipment. Um, and uh, um, now um, you can have uh, this type of uh, fuel cells uh, uh, contribute even more to the uh, uh, to the overall efficiency of the data center simply because you know th these are devices operating at high temperature in internally high temperatures uh, up to 700 degrees or so uh, so exhaust air is in the vicinity of 350 degrees and uh, um, a combination of that hot air with absorption chillers um, uh, will create an environment that uh, that essentially the cooling is is uh, almost free as part of this process, so uh, uh, you create a high efficiency source uh, that uh, generates typically uh, significant less than the equivalent utility. So it has a sustainability benefit. It's a it, it ha it's a reliable um, um, component that uh, deliver power quality equivalent to uh, a combination utility. Uh, UPS battery, which is in the traditional way of delivering power to the computer and data centers, and finally have this uh, um, economic uh, economic benefit uh, that uh, um, because uh, you can essentially uh, lower the the PoE of the of the facility dramatically. Um, so I think that that's one uh, one type of technology that uh, that can be used. Uh, uh, and it's being used uh, 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 these days for on-site generation. But there are other players out there. Obviously, um, one of them is it's a company called uh, Mainspring. It's a it's a startup, but it has a you know my opinion a, a great potential. It's a linear generator, uh, and as I said, uh, it can use pretty much any kind of fuel, anything from from um, methane to hydrogen to to ammonia, uh, and uh, it's a it's an interesting uh, uh, technology. Linear generators have been uh, around for a long time. Uh, what what this device does, it's uh, um, it it uses these uh, uh, chambers, enclosed chambers, with a piston where uh, where fuel is injected uh, in in inside the inside the the chamber, and uh, um, and uh, um, it. Due to the spring, uh, the, uh, the the piston composed of air and uh, and fuel, and when that this happens, the the molecule within the the mixtures uh, collide uh, significantly, very collide faster and faster until until they start uh, um, you know breaking apart and uh, reform into a different type of molecules. And uh, the energy, the bond, uh, the energy that bonds this this molecule together is released. Uh, that uh, and uh, this energy will put pressure on this uh, on this uh, on, on the piston. So the, the 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 chamber expands, move the move the, the pistons, uh, and that's where the linear generator, which essentially is, uh, so, is a set of uh, permanent so, magnet. Uh, so what's the linear generator going to replace? 
uh, or replace uh, the the actual generator, uh, the uh, actual source of power when there is a you know, any kind of uh, that's the the, uh, the output of and, the generator and, is 480 volts or 380 volts or whatever it is. Right, but what do you see as the timeline for that? Because they're not mainstream yet, are they? I would say three years, two, three years. That's pretty soon. OK, what other types of, of energy storage do you think is uh, we're going to be hearing a lot more about? Well, I think that uh, um, I think that um, um, we're going to see um, um, applications where uh, uh, we're going to um, we're going to use uh, um, energy storage um, batteries in combination either in combination with uh, uh solar or with uh, uh or with uh wind turbines or or e even utilities uh, um the, uh, the the issue obviously with renewable uh, at large scale is storage right um and this is this we we got to the point where uh, unless we resolve the storage uh, the storage problem uh, um, adding more more renewable probably will not going to have the same significant effect that they had in the past so so we have to address that problem so we have a number of options there um, the most common type of storage these days is um, you know lithium ion batteries that have been uh, used consistently throughout uh, it's an uh, industry tr primarily driven by, by the ev uh, electric vehicle uh, business, but uh, uh, but the stationary applications also benefit from uh, from uh, what uh, um, lithium ion battery uh, provide. Um, you know, higher density and uh, uh, higher energy density and uh, footprint and uh, and um, long life. Uh, you know, relatively high number of uh, cycling and so on. I think that there are n new technologies out there that are going to have an interesting impact. Sodium ion batteries. Uh, there are new type of sodium ba ion batteries that might be uh, uh, might have a, a little lower energy uh, density than uh, lithium ion. But for stationary application, that's not that critical. We're not talking about EV here, but uh, but they they have uh, they could have much uh, uh, higher cycling capability, uh, and uh, you know they are safer to uh, to operate uh, the, uh, the the self ignition that uh, uh, we have seen uh, uh, on lithium is not going to occur with uh, sodium ion batteries, and uh, the single most important element here uh, is. Is cost. Uh, the cost of uh, of storage is enormous, uh, especially lithium ion batteries. Yeah, uh, sodium ion batteries could be uh, could uh, uh, resolve that. But there are other uh, other technologies uh, out there. The um, uh, all the metal batteries uh, are. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting option. Um, there you go, the, fl the flow flow batteries as yeah, well. Yeah, a variety of a variety of flow batteries. Uh, there there is still some cost issues there, and uh, um, and uh, but the flow battery uh, battery battery, for instance, uh, offer um, a uh, higher scalability uh, advantage. Uh, uh, you can you can. Uh, uh, modularly increase the capacity as the data center demand uh, increases. So, um, on the other hand, for uh, for larger applications, uh, where we're talking about hundreds of kilowatts for days, even weeks, um, probably the most attractive options today is using compressed air. Compressed air stored either in cavities underground or in in uh, specific tanks. Um, it's a more expensive uh, uh, technology up front, but uh, but uh, the levelized cost of of uh, electricity uh, LCE is is lower, significantly lower than uh, than chemical batteries. And then we have obviously the the hydrogen uh, option. Hydrogen has been you know it's becoming very a big big. Uh, Topic these days, uh, uh, and there is an enormous amount of work in providing what is this called uh, green hydrogen uh, for uh, for a variety of applications, and obviously they apply very well to uh, data centers. And there are projects today 
that uh, use hydrogen both for uh, uh, base load uh, devices, primarily primarily fuel cells, but also for standby applications uh, to replace uh, diesel generators. And uh, um, the problem with uh, with hydrogen is is not necessarily generation. There are, there are technology today that can make uh, green hydrogen at uh, um, you know more attractive uh, uh, cost level. Uh, historically. Uh, uh, Green hydrogen has been at least three times more expensive than uh, brown or gray hydrogen. Problem with hydrogen is transportation. How do you uh, how do you move hydrogen from its uh, uh, from the location where it's generated to the location where it's it's been used, and also storage to uh, a lesser extent. Right now, ammonia, uh, particularly green ammonia, is the most uh, common vehicle because ammonia is, uh, is easier to transport in liquid liquid form. But if you take a look at, uh, at the conversion from uh, water uh, to hydrogen, from hydrogen to ammonia transportation, and at the other end conversion from ammonia to hydrogen and from hydrogen to electricity, you can see of a, of a solution like this, it's um, it's in the, the 30 between 30 and 40 percent not spectacular to say the least so uh, just before we finish here peter let's talk just a little bit about um, um small modular reactors and you, what you think their potential is and where yeah the smr is uh is started as the answer to all our problems uh, um <laughs> uh, so many it, technologies it, there's so many technologies out there i started looking into this myself and i think that Kind of about 30 different types of SMR. At least, at least. Um, but none of them will going to become commercially available until the end of the uh, until the end of the decade. Uh, so we need to <laughs> to address some of the problems today. Uh, by then, a bit late. But uh, but if you look at the whole SMR uh, 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 program, it's indeed um, a lot of companies are are working on this. And uh, if you look at uh, the whole landscape there are four technologies out there um, you know th the most common is the light water reactors because uh, um, it's it's the safest technology is uh, it's been proven in the field it's a uh, 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 much safer than the conventional large uh, large uh, uh, reactors. Is, it, is this, is this but, the ones that they've got in in Russia and China I'm not sure which ones they are you said they have been proven but proven where uh, proven, uh, you know, in uh, most of the reactors in the United States use uh, uh, light, 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 uh, uh, light water reactors. Uh, so the large and, uh, scale PWR reactors. The best example is the fleet of uh, uh, nuclear submarines that they've been around since the 50s, right? Uh, uh, for, yeah, yeah. for 70 years, and uh, uh, we have never seen a uh, uh, nuclear accident in any of the submarines or. Uh, Are you sure there's no submarines or, missing? There's no missing submarines. I'll, yeah, when we finish there, I'm going to go and count, count them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, there are some other, other technology. The uh, fast uh, neuron uh, neutron reactors are, uh, yeah, are supposed to be more efficient and uh, um, the, the fuel can be uh, can be used for a longer period of time, uh, up to 20 years. So there are some some uh, some benefits there. Uh, you know, these are smaller in size, and uh, um, as I said, need refueling only about 20 years or so. Uh, but but they are not proven. So the safety the safety case uh, ought to be proven here. So that that might take a, a longer time. And then there are, um, you know, other technologies. Um, you know, I don't remember them all, but the one is uh, graphene moderated uh, high temperature reactors. Uh, um, there is another one called um, uh, using um, using um, molten salt salt reactors. Um, yeah, we're gonna see. As just you said, uh, thirty different companies are. Uh, are uh, yeah, but the uh, molten salt one, one, I think I, I understand that one is, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, at least the company I've heard of is is, uh, is, is a Nordic company that's going to dispatch these from South Korea, and the time frame is shorter. But I think one of the main problems is licensing, right? Right, right. And uh, I think that uh, the first uh, SMRs we're going to see outside Western Europe and United States uh, 
I think the, the first one is going to be installed in Poland, uh, simply because the whole regulatory process is less onerous, less <laughs> convoluted. How receptive do you think the data center industry is to the idea of uh, moving into the power generation business? Because traditionally, it's been a bit of a no-no, hasn't it? Yeah, right. Um, look, um, talking to people in the, this industry today, the, all I can hear is uh, we need power, we need low cost power and we need green power. It's this is the single most important element today. Uh, and that's driven by the size of the hyperscalers. This is driven by the advent of AI and the enormous, uh, enormous uh, uh, power demand uh, AI both training and uh, uh, inference uh, will, will demand. Uh, also, um, edge data centers uh, physically located in urban environments, uh, uh, it's not that easy to, to bring, uh, to deliver power. So all p power is becoming a big, uh, a, a big deal. So uh, data centers are, whether, whether they like it or not, are moving into the, into the power business. Uh, um, Dealing with utility, dealing with uh, uh, independent uh, power providers is becoming a big, a very important task within most of the large data center players. So, um, whether they like it or not, uh, they're gonna they're gonna have to be in this uh, uh, in the in the power business for the foreseeable future. Terrific, terrific. So, I think that's a good place to leave everything. Um, if you're watching this, um, stay tuned. There are further topics that we're going to dig into with Peter and Ed, so that will include uh, a more of a deep dive on SMRs and green hydrogen, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the pipeline. So thank you, Peter, for joining us today.